Oh, let me see what this is all about. What are you doing, Seth? Well, I'm looking at a recently released video taken by Navy pilots. Supposedly, they imaged an unusual flying object with their infrared cameras. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. My gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Oh, I think, dude. It is a weird-looking object. I don't know what it is. Well, I don't either, but people are saying it's evidence of a UFO, an alien spacecraft, and that it's part of a secret government program to hide the evidence. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology, and we devote one episode a month to critical thinking skeptic check. In this episode an unpublicized Pentagon program to investigate unidentified flying objects has come to light. It validates the suspicions of those who claim that such a secret program existed. On top of that, the release of a video from pilots of an unidentified object in the sky is pointed to as just the kind of evidence of visitation the government is hiding from us. Does a secret government program looking into UFOs mean there also exists secret government proof of them? It's Skeptic Check, New UFO Evidence. If I want to see an alien craft come to Earth, all I have to do is pop in my DVD of the day the Earth stood still. A large object traveling at supersonic speed is headed over the North Atlantic toward the east coast of the United States. But science fiction is, after all, fiction. But could visitation be real? Well, for decades, a large fraction of the population has maintained that Earth is being visited by aliens. And when challenged about the evidence, they'll say that, well, yeah, there is good evidence, but the government is keeping it from us. It's being covered up as part of a secret government program. Sounds a bit far-fetched, but as it turns out, it was recently revealed that there was a secret government UFO program. In December 2017, we learned that a program called the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program ran for five years before being shut down. This disclosure has validated the claims of those Americans who have said that the government has been withholding the truth about UFOs from us for years. But does the fact that there was a secret Pentagon study mean there is also secret proof of alien craft? We will examine what the existence of a secret government program reveals and also the quality of one piece of evidence in the form of a publicly released video. But first, let's look at what we know about this news story. This story about the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program came out in a New York Times article. Retired Air Force pilot and astronomer James McGahey is a longtime investigator of UFO reports and claims, and he says this most recent story was set in motion when independent journalist Leslie Kane was approached by Luis Elizondo, the former director of the Advanced Aerospace Threat Information Program. It is not exactly clear, but he apparently asked to release this information, and Leslie Kane got access to it, and as a result, the New York Times article was written about it. Leslie Kane has long reported on UFOs and has written a book of first-hand accounts from government officials and pilots who have witnessed phenomena in the skies that they cannot explain. She learned the details of the Pentagon program from Mr. Elizondo. Her co-authored story appeared on the front page of the New York Times. As these things tend to do, it made headlines because, you know, top secret government program finally revealed. And so it made a lot of splashes, particularly in the UFO community. I'm Benjamin Radford, and I'm a research fellow with the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. And immediately we began hearing these stories coming out. People saying, oh, the cracks are finally showing, right? Soon the government's going to be telling us all it knows. The Pentagon program, we learned, was started in 2007, but not because there was suddenly new evidence of possible extraterrestrial visitation. James Oberg is a space journalist and historian. It appears from the description of the people now testifying that it was begun at the behest of a congressman to help out or to get information from a person in his district who was interested in UFOs and has lots of money. 
you could almost look at it as sort of a pork project, <laughs> you know. In this particular case, we know that the program was introduced and sponsored by Harry Reid, who wanted to basically give his buddy, a man named Robert Bigelow, who's been a longtime fan of UFOs and interested in that, a contract to do the research. Uh, this study, which was done in the Defense Intelligence Agency, the best I can determine was never classified in the sense of a true classified program. Senator Harry Reid tried to get it changed to limited access. It's sort of a term used. We're not going to tell a lot of people about it, but it's not really classified. A program to study unusual flying objects has long been of interest. After all, we do want to know what's up in the sky, says Mr. Oberg. I would be sorry if the DIA and the CIA were not looking at UFO reports around the world, because in those reports, I have found in my own research vastly interesting data about rockets and space events taking place in Russia and China and elsewhere that can tell us a lot about what's going on because my experience with UFO reports largely in the area of Russia and China is that a very large fraction of them are actual military activities, tests and failures of aerospace hardware. It has been that way for 50 years. The focus of this study, however, was not about learning more about Russian or Chinese missile tests. James McGehey. The scope of the study as it was set up, and uh, it was highly influenced by Robert Bigelow through Senator Reid, was to investigate basically military reports, primarily pilot reports, potentially of strange objects they might see in the sky, because a number of these people involved in promoting this believe that there were alien spacecraft flying around in the Earth's atmosphere. The man who won the contract to manage the Defense Intelligence Agency program was Robert Bigelow, a billionaire entrepreneur and founder of Bigelow Aerospace, headquartered in Nevada. His company builds habitable inflatable structures for private companies and government use. Well, I worked with Bigelow on his space projects. In fact, I was with him for one of his commercial launches out of a Russian ICBM base in Siberia about 10 years ago. And his commitment to that project and his management of it is unusual, let's say, but effective. He was a very good organizer of that project, and he's got a module now on the space station that may be a prototype of a module that will house people on their way to Mars. So he's serious about that, and personally, I think he's a person of high integrity. But he's also very interested in the UFO phenomenon. He studied it for a long time and done a lot of research. I don't know what the results are. He keeps them to himself. Perhaps there's a feeling that if the UFOs are real, and he does the study, uh, his company would be able to make use of any discoveries, any patents, any uh, technologies that are found. How much money was involved here? I mean, are we talking big bucks? In this particular case, the estimates that I've seen are about $22 million, although uh, from what I can tell, that's over the course of the entire project. But, you know, this is still taxpayer money. And so uh, Senator Reed went ahead and as a line item, just to put it in the budget to uh, have someone study it and call it something else maybe so that people who are bookkeeping wouldn't notice what it really was about. The $22 million allocated by the government to this office, a lucrative contract by some standards, but a drop in the bucket of the Pentagon's overall $600 billion budget, seems to have been managed by Mr. Bigelow. The New York Times reported that Bigelow Airspace hired subcontractors to do the research for the program. What happened was the money went out of the DIA, most of it to Robert Bigelow in Nevada. He contracted out, apparently, to a some UFO groups to look for UFOs and spent a lot of money retrofitting his warehouses that he claimed he had stored alien artifacts from alien spaceships. Well, technically, the article said that the modified buildings in Las Vegas were for the storage of materials that came from unidentified aerial phenomena. Other details of the program itself, including its methodology and conclusions, are still vague. You know, it's not clear what the uh, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program was actually doing. A lot of the information still hasn't been released. A little bit was released, including a, a few videos from the U.S. Navy. So we just don't know a lot of the details in terms of what exactly was the scope of the inquiry and what, what research was conducted. From what I can tell, it seemed to be that they sort of combed through reports from the Navy and Air Force and other places 
asking for any so-called unexplained reports, anything that was encountered that wasn't immediately identified. An unusual aerial encounter by Navy pilots was released to the public. It immediately made the rounds on social media. A video was released with this New York Times article about this program. The video dates from 2004, three years before this program started. It shows a F-18 far infrared camera imaging something, and it shows sort of an oblong object in the video for a minute or so. Oh my gosh. We're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Oh, I think, dude. And it basically just shows what appears to be an infrared image. Uh, it's not even clear from, from the footage. There's, there's lots of questions about what exactly the circumstances were that the video shot. It appears to be some object far in the sky that is, well, if it's infrared, then it's a different temperature than the surrounding uh, sky, which, of course, is what you expect from a flying craft. And that's the question. What's seen in the video appears to be some sort of puzzling flying object, at the very least, it fulfills the U of UFO. It is unidentified. But is this decade-old video the most tangible thing to come from this five-year secret government UFO program? It's all we have at the moment, along with tantalizing claims that there's more. And, of course, the revelation that such a government program existed. As far as we know, the program ended in 2012, and it ended not because they had actually finally found <laughs> evidence of, of extraterrestrial craft or recovered bodies, but because really it was not productive. There was nothing there. The program, over its $22 million cost in its years in development, didn't really yield any useful information about what may be flying over our skies, and so it was discontinued. So that's the story. For five years, there was a very well hidden Pentagon program to investigate anomalous phenomena in the sky and UFOs, if you like. And this kind of validates the point of view that many people have had for a long time. There was a 2002 CNN survey in which they found that something like 80% of the population of the United States figured that at least some of the UFOs were alien craft. But not only that, the government, the federal government, was keeping information from them relevant to that point of view. And that's what makes this an intriguing story. If the first part of that suspicion is true, that the government has indeed had a secret program to investigate UFOs, is the second part true that the government has secret evidence of UFOs and it is keeping that from them as well? Good evidence, that is. Evidence that would change the point of view of the skeptics who say, you know, we don't believe we're being visited. The government UFO program ended in 2012. The suggestion is that it did so because it didn't find anything, so there was no reason to continue. But let's consider this. Is it true that nothing was discovered? Is it possible that, as some suggest, the government has really found proof of alien craft? Well, let's look at the evidence as it's been presented. One source for what the covert program uncovered is Luis Elizondo, the ex-military intelligence official who was in charge of the program and who approached the New York Times. He was interviewed on CNN three days after the Times piece appeared. Mr. Elizondo maintained that the motivation for the program was national security, to identify unknown aerial phenomena and try to determine whether or not they are a potential threat. That seems plausible. Although it does raise the question of why the government gave the contract to a business entrepreneur, Robert Bigelow. Why not to science experts in atmospheric physics or even aviation? And why aren't the artifacts from unidentified aerial phenomena in his buildings being made available to material scientists or other researchers for study? Look, people have been clamoring for physical evidence for decades. So if that evidence is stacked up in some buildings in Las Vegas, let's open the doors. Well, Mr. Elizondo told CNN that the government program uncovered a lot and that there is a lot of evidence that the government hasn't released. Well, perhaps. But if the evidence isn't released, no one can evaluate it. He did, however, give broad descriptions of what the program found. He said that the program identified anomalous types of aircraft, 
things that don't have any obvious forms of propulsion and moving in ways that included extreme maneuverability beyond the healthy G-forces for a human or anything biological. He claims they saw craft with hypersonic velocity, low observability, and objects that, quote, seemingly defy the laws of aerodynamics. Now, Seth, when you hear that they saw objects that don't have any obvious forms of propulsion, what does that mean? Well, I think all he's saying is that, uh, you know, he didn't see any engines or propellers or contrails or, you know, anything that would indicate how it's being powered. And beyond the healthy G-forces for a human or anything biological, <laughs> what are G-forces? Well, G-forces, that's just the acceleration that you feel, you know, on, on Earth you have one G, that's gravity. But uh, if you're in your car and you accelerate, of course, you, you know, you get thrown back in your seat. If you have G-forces that are, you know, 5 or 10 or 20 Gs, uh, it's probably going to uh, kill you. So... <laughs> Okay, so these are objects that are moving very fast. Yeah, it's not even just the speed, it's the acceleration. They suddenly take off like a jackrabbit. And a low observability? Well, I, th I don't know what that means except to say that it's hard to see them. Okay, and that these objects seemingly defy the laws of aerodynamics. I think what he's trying to say there is that, you know, it seems to be moving across the sky and suddenly it takes off in some direction. I mean, you know, that's something that's very, very difficult for flying craft to do. Okay, so these are extraordinary claims. Yes, they are. I mean, it seems that what he's saying is that they identified something flying in a way that no known aircraft can, and that would be extraordinary. In fact, it could be the biggest story of the century. And if there's evidence that these were craft from an alien civilization, well, that would be an even bigger story. The biggest story of the last two centuries. Yes, that's right. But we can only go on his word that imagery or radar evidence of these extraordinary feats of aviation exist because it's not being released. And what good is evidence if you can't see it? However, Mr. Elizondo also said in this CNN interview that in his opinion, we may not be alone. In other words... He seems to be saying that these craft were being piloted by extraterrestrials. But, of course, that's making a very dramatic conclusion before ruling out other possibilities. And that's right. The U in UFO means unidentified. It doesn't mean alien. Mr. Elizondo says, interestingly, that there's a lot we don't know, and that may be the single unassailable fact of his interview. Okay, well, neither Mr. Elizondo nor the government are releasing the good stuff. So uh, we have to evaluate the only evidence from this project that was released, the 2004 video recorded by Navy pilots. We'll do that next. It's our monthly look at critical thinking on Big Picture Science, Skeptic Check, New UFO Evidence. The idea that Earth is being visited by aliens is a reliable trope of science fiction. We created a race of robots. Their function is to patrol the planets in spaceships like this one and preserve the peace. It's always amused me that the alien in that film speaks with a refined British accent. Another fictional plot line is that the aliens are visiting Earth and the government has buried the evidence in a secret program. Regardless of what you may have read in the tabloids, there have never been any spacecraft recovered by our government. Take my word for it. There's no Area 51. <laughs> There's no recovered spaceship. Oh, excuse me, Mr. President. That's not entirely accurate. But those ideas about UFOs are the purview of science fiction, right? Well, as we know now, that's not entirely accurate. There was a secret Pentagon program to investigate unidentified flying objects. The Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program operated in the Pentagon shadows from 2007 until 2012, although technically it wasn't classified. But when its existence was revealed in a New York Times article, it stirred the conspiracy buffs. Some say that the existence of the program suggests that there's also secret government proof of alien visitation. The former director of the program, Luis Elizondo, is on the record hinting that this is the case. The government has compiled examples of truly puzzling flying behavior by unidentified craft. Now, he released only a single instance of the purported evidence, 
a previously classified video recorded in 2004 by Navy pilots. This one minute video is all we have, and so we are forced to assume that it is typical of the strength of the evidence that the government supposedly has. So what's on the video? Well, it may be that seeing is believing, but it might be just as apt to say, I'll see it when I believe it. In other words, it's possible that we see what we want to be true. That's according to retired military pilot and astronomer James McGahey, a longtime investigator of UFO reports and claims. He is a scientific consultant to the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, and he reminds us that if we're not trained to know what we're looking at in the sky, our brain will creatively fill in the gaps. James, the video that was released is part of this story. It's about a minute long and so forth, and it shows uh, imagery from one of these fighters off the coast of uh, San Diego. What do you see when you look at that video? What, you know, can you describe it? Yeah, when you see the video, you see the screen of the infrared camera with the two little bars which lock onto a target there, and you see a little oblong object in between the bars, which is what the infrared camera is seeing is the differential heat. Then along the side of the video, you see various parameters of the aircraft. You see the two lines running across diagonally are the bank angle of the aircraft. And then you see the altitude listed on there and various other parameters of the aircraft. So you're seeing all of this while the camera is just attempting to stay locked on to whatever they're detecting uh, differential heat out there. Far infrared cameras are not very high resolution. They're detecting uh, basically the heat and the glow of the heat, not what the object actually looks like. So the reason that this is considered unusual is that there's this object that appears in the far infrared, which is to say it's an object that is warmer than the clouds in the, in, in the distance behind it. And it has this kind of uh, oblong shape. And, uh, you know, the, the, this camera locks onto it and it stays visible for quite some time and then uh, apparently rotates. Is that a good summary of what they're seeing and why this video is even out there? Well, it's a good summary of what they're seeing when you're talking just about the video, yes. Remember, in that case, they saw nothing visually. All they saw was what was on the infrared camera. When you look at that and you see this object in the center of the field of view, what does it look like to you? Do you have any opinion on that? I don't have enough data to definitively say, but what it almost certainly is, is the jet exhaust on an aircraft at some distance away. It could be either another military aircraft or a commercial airplane, you know, and it could be out, you know, tens of miles away from them as well, because what you're seeing there is not an actual object. You're seeing a heat signature from an object, and it looks like it could possibly be multiple objects close together indicating two jet engines on an aircraft at some distance away. Remember, when they shot those videos, they saw nothing visually. And if the plane banks, either the fighter jet or the whatever the plane is that they're looking at, if they're looking at a plane, if one banks relative to the other, then those two jets would change their their angle and it would look like the thing was rotating. And you do see that in the video. Right. It's likely that the strange motions of this is a result of the camera slewing. The camera slews on the aircraft to lock onto the object. And the aircraft itself banking. And when you say slewing, James, you mean uh, motion of the camera from left to right kind of motion? Right. The camera can move on the F-18 to track the target. So it's unlikely that what you see in the video is moving at all. It's the result of the camera moving and the aircraft moving. James, uh, why is it that professional or actually amateur astronomers seldom see these UFOs. I mean, there are tens of thousands of amateur astronomers, and every clear night they're out there with their scopes. They're spending a lot of time looking at the sky, and they don't seem to see this stuff. Well, there's a really simple question to that that goes back to the idea of a trained observer, which is very often used for pilots and police officers. Amateur astronomers look at the sky, and they know what they're looking at. 
when they see something they can't quite identify, they put a telescope on it, and they can't identify it. And as a result, they virtually never see anything that would be reported as a UFO. However, pilots are not trained observers, and police officers are not trained observers, and they see things in the sky all the time that they don't understand what they are because they don't know astronomy, atmospheric physics, and various other things that could possibly cause lights in the sky. When UFOs are identified, and I think that if you spend some time investigating uh, some of these descriptions, you usually can identify them. Well, what's the laundry list of things they could be? I mean, what are the things that are most commonly misidentified as possibly being alien visitors? Most commonly, it turns out to be astronomical objects, uh, Venus, Jupiter, Mars, when they're very bright in the sky. Balloons in recent years have accounted for a lot. And, of course, rocket launches always account for much as the rockets separate as they're staging going up and uh, they result in plumes from the exhaust. What about aircraft? Aircraft are not as much in recent years uh, identified as UFOs. Now, something that is going to become more and more identified as UFOs is or drones. Drones are becoming much more common, and they have very unusual patterns on them. And because of the way they move, they can move in directions that are sort of counter to what normal aircraft move. They are definitely starting to cause more UFO reports and and will in the future cause a great deal more. Now, James, you're a former military pilot. Uh, Do you see strange things? I mean, have you seen strange things up there in the sky? Uh, Things that you might not have seen if you just stayed in your backyard barbecuing something? Well, that's an interesting story, and I often talk about this when I give lectures on the subject. I have 40,000 hours looking at the night sky as an astronomer. I have shot millions of images of the night sky. I have thousands of hours flying at night in airplanes. I have never once in all of that time looking at the sky ever seen anything I didn't understand what it was. Well, what about the fact that some of these pilot reports, you know, there's actually a certain commonality to them because they'll say, well, this thing was, you know, moving at extraordinarily high speed, you know, Mach 8 or something, something that, you know, aircraft really can't do, and then it would make a right turn and zoom off in a different direction. How credible are those reports? I don't consider them very credible. First off, when anybody says they see something visually, whether it be a pilot or anyone else, that an object is moving a certain speed, that is impossible. Your eyeballs are not calibrated instruments. If something is moving, you have to know how big it is, how far away it is, the angular velocity of it, and this is not something that most people can do visually, including pilots. So if you look at this and they say something like this, you have to realize that they're seeing something in a very short period of time, they don't know what it is, and they're attaching their beliefs and perceptions to it, and the human visual system, which is fraught with all kinds of errors, where it fills in stuff which is not actually happening. Finally, James, you know, when people talk to you, and I'm sure many of them do, and say, look, You know, you're just being closed-minded about all this. You're not looking at the evidence. We've got all this uh, witness testimony, you know, thousands of people, and then many of these witnesses are what you would say are credible people. They're pilots, they're astronauts, they're whatever. What do you say to them? I would say that I look at data and evidence. And if there is no evidence, then it's not science, and it's not interesting to science. There is zero evidence, there is zero empirical evidence that the Earth has ever been visited by an alien spacecraft. Simple. That's it. James McGahey, thank you so very much for talking with us. You're welcome. James McGahey is a retired military pilot and astronomer. He's a longtime investigator of UFO reports and claims, and he's a scientific consultant to the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. Well, 
If this video from the Navy pilots is typical of the quality of the evidence from the UFO project, it doesn't suggest that the evidence is very strong. Now, you would think they would release one of the better pieces of evidence, in fact, in order to give credence to what they're saying. But in any case, it's certainly not incontrovertible proof of some sort of a craft moving at hypersonic velocities defying the laws of aerodynamics. I mean, there's this blob in the center of the field of view. It doesn't go anywhere. It just stays there pretty much. Maybe it's the blob from outer space. Yes, it's but yeah, but it never lands. I don't know. It doesn't eat anybody. But, you know, remember, this is an infrared cam, and so what you're looking at is heat. And uh, indeed, I mean, it's perfectly compatible with looking at the back end of, a, of an airplane far away. Well, it may be unidentified, so it suits the U in UFO, but until you rule out the many ordinary phenomena that it could be, it's not evidence of much of anything. Space journalist and historian James Oberg says the Navy video follows the long pattern of photographic and video evidence that is submitted to support UFO sightings. There's a bigger issue here about perception. These images are recorded on instruments that we didn't have 10, 20, 30 years ago. This is from about 10 years ago. 30 or 40 years ago, such an object, if it occurred or visited the Earth, would be absolutely unseen by human senses. But the objects that were being reported in the 40s and 50s were so obvious that if they were occurring now, we would have hundreds of solid videotapes of them from people's camcorders. The perception of these anomalous objects appears to be always just at and beyond the limit of human capabilities to observe, just at the edge, just like the old dragon used to be over the edge of the map. And as your cartographic and knowledge improved, the home of the dragons retreated mile by mile over the centuries. Just as we get smarter and sharper eyed with our instruments, the UFOs get more and more elusive. That suggests to me that what's going on is has to do with our perception and not with some a standalone phenomena. So what you're saying is that uh, the, the UFOs will always be at the edge of what we could possibly detect. It's just always struck me that with all the thousands of satellites that we have that are pointed toward the Earth to map everything from weather to military moves by uh, other countries and so forth, that they don't seem to see any of this stuff, and yet somebody in their backyard does. There's various answers to that, the conspiratorial answers. Another example of that, though, is the observation of anomalies on, on, on the moon and other planets, that in the 40s and 50s, or even before that, 100, 100 years ago, uh, it was planetary-wide systems of canals being observed. As we got sharper-eyed, we realized they, they weren't there, and people began to see other things, like statuary or even a bridge on the moon that was miles and miles long. And as we got better and better cameras and got closer, then these anomalies kept being spotted, but they were smaller and smaller and smaller. And, and now there's a two-mile-high monolith on the, on the Martian moon that, that is spotted, and it's just at the edge of the pixel resolution of our cameras. That's the here-be-dragons mode of, of discovery and perception. It, it doesn't prove there's anything there except the edge of our own sight. When I talk to people who are convinced that we're being visited by, by craft from other worlds and so forth, and I say, so why isn't this uh, evidence in the Smithsonian? Why aren't there thousands of scientists looking into this? They say, because the good evidence has been covered up by the government. Apparently, all the good evidence always falls into the hands of the government. And this seems to kind of justify that point of view, does it not? It would if what was being reported is actually what was there, because uh, we don't have enough information. And I, as I said, I'm not doing any kind of shoot from the hip uh, debunking on stuff that is highly technical. There are other people looking at this. It takes it sometimes takes time and takes uh, takes research to check it out. One thing for sure, if uh, the claims being made for the, the videos are coming from people who apparently were not competent to uh, actually investigate them. In the past, we have had baffling-looking videos like this before. They come across the transom, they're checked out, and they have always turned out to have other explanations that the people touting them as unexplainable just were incapable of finding. All right, so if people point to those videos that we haven't been able to explain so far, and maybe some will come out of this program, but, uh, you know, that, that remains to be seen— and argue that on that basis, the fact that we don't know what they are, that they may be alien craft, that strikes me as an argument from ignorance. Uh, in other words, it's the idea that absence of evidence is somehow proof of, well, their hypothesis. 
I run into the same the same logic. The fact that uh, there is no evidence is proof that there's a cover-up. That's face palm time. Well, well, finally, James, when you step back and you look at the bigger picture here, I mean, this UFO biz has been going on since the late 40s, so we're, you know, 70-some years into it. Has this study gotten us any closer to the truth? Uh, are we ever going to settle the question of whether alien craft are visiting our skies? Well, at some point, we'll be far enough out in the skies to know. And at some point, uh, I would not be surprised if we found that not just evidence of alien microbes, but of, of alien technology. Uh, here, we could hear them. We could come across something. It's something that you always keep in the back of your mind when you're seeing unusual things. But it's not anywhere near the top of the list. James Oberg, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thanks, Seth. It's a topic of limitless fascination for me. James Oberg is a space journalist and historian. We look at why it's hard to shake belief in UFOs, even when the evidence for them is not compelling. Also, we reveal another intriguing fact in the Pentagon UFO story. It's our monthly look at critical thinking on big picture science, skeptic check, new UFO evidence. While we don't know the details of the Pentagon's hidden UFO program, the promise of compelling video evidence of alien craft and exotic artifacts in storage is nothing more than that, promise. The single video that was released does not provide conclusive proof of alien visitation. So what is behind these claims that solid proof of UFOs exists? Well, we don't know, but we can share one fact we noted in our analysis of the story that should be taken into consideration. Since the government UFO program ended, its former director, Luis Elizondo, has entered into business with Tom DeLong, the former guitarist and singer in the band Blink-182. Their venture, called To the Stars Academy of Arts and Sciences, was kept under wraps until October 2017. The New York Times story about the Pentagon UFO study broke two months later. The article noted that Mr. Elizondo and his partners were speaking publicly about the UFO issues because their venture hopes to raise money for research into UFOs. And the website for To The Stars describes it as a group of former U.S. intelligence officers that want to use their expertise to bring into the open transformative science and engineering that has been held top secret. The website is soliciting monies for their venture. However, we looked up the To The Stars registration with the Security and Exchange Commission, where publicly traded companies are required to disclose intent and business plan. Among the goals of To The Stars are to support exotic engineering and transformative research. The examples they give include beamed energy propulsion, warp drive metrics, and telepathy. And the latter two are questionable in my book, and frankly, should be in anybody's book, all of this to the stars will bring to market by leapfrogging traditional academic and scientific development. It does not mention UFO research. The SEC filing states that to the stars will create unique entertainment experiences that will be produced by its entertainment division. In other words, entertainment is a big component of their business, and that was not noted by the New York Times. So given the dates of the company going public and the New York Times article, it sounds as if the motive of releasing the video and the details of the Pentagon program were time to create intrigue and publicity for this new public company. To the Stars is looking to raise $50 million, according to the SEC, and according to the website for To the Stars, they so far have raised $2 million from investors. Well, obviously, you can invest in this if you wish, but I have to say, any company that promises to make money on, well, things like telepathy and so forth, I mean, it doesn't sound like a great investment to me personally. Well, even if the smoking gun that would prove the existence of alien craft is missing, and even if we have concerns about why this story came to light when it did, the truth is, for some people, it just doesn't matter. For many Americans, belief in UFOs as alien craft is not shaken by the lack of evidence or credulous reporting, 
In fact, the lack of evidence only strengthens their belief. Benjamin Radford, a research fellow with the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, has written extensively about this particular psychological phenomenon. It's remarkable to look at the psychology of the UFO believer and see the rationalizations as to why they don't have good evidence, particularly with with UFO claims. I mean, these are literally things that are unidentified flying in the air. There are things that all of us could potentially see. You know, in some cases, you're, you're talking about, you know, telescopes and space probes. But for the most part, UFOs are or at least should be, in the public domain. They're crashing, allegedly. <laughs> they're, they're being bodies found, allegedly. So this is not something that only scientists and astronomers should be able to find and see. <laughs> These are things that, that presumably should be accessible to pretty much anyone. But, of course, that's when you get into the men in black and the cover-up and the conspiracies and, you know, people being threatened not to talk, and you just go down the rabbit hole. You make the point that just because the government spent $22 million on this project doesn't mean that they found anything. You draw parallels to Project Stargate, which I think ran from the mid-1970s to the 1990s before it was shut down. What did Stargate investigate, and did it find anything? (laughs) One of the most amusing parts of this whole story is the notion that I often hear that, well, there must be something to it because the DOD spent, you know, $22 million on it. (laughs) I'm like, have you seen our government? Do you... Do, do you read the news? I mean, the, the fact is that the government spends enormous amounts of money on projects that go absolutely nowhere and have no chance of being successful. You can look at the Star Wars program that was initiated during the Reagan era. You can look at abstinence-only sex education. There's, there's, there's a laundry list of, of programs and projects you know, that millions of taxpayer dollars were spent on that had no chance of success and, and yielded nothing at all. And there's also uh, Project Stargate, which was initiated during the the Cold War era to uh, determine whether or not there were psychic spies being used by the Russians. And there was a real concern among some people in the government at the time that there were psychic spies that were maybe compromising national security. Well, wait, 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 wait. When you say psychic spies, do you mean people who can sort of remote view? They can see, I don't know, classified documents from thousands of miles away by just (laughs) putting their fingers to their forehead and closing their eyes? Well, it sounds silly when you put it that way, but yeah, that's exactly what the thought was. You know, the, the, the psychic spies were sort of thought to be these what are called remote viewers, where people would be able to envision from across the world uh, classified secrets or, or the design of weapons and things like that. So the program lasted from the 1970s through the mid-1990s, and eventually it was discontinued. Uh, what happened was that it was handed over to the CIA, and several people, including a colleague of mine, Ray Hyman, was asked to analyze the data they had collected. And after looking at it, they realized there was no evidence whatsoever that psychic power existed or remote viewers could do what they claimed to do. All right. Well, it was a good use of tax dollars. At the risk, <laughs> Ben, at the risk of uh, beating an expired equine here, let me just say, it strikes me that if all these reports of UFOs were, or at least some of them, were indeed alien craft, And given that there are dozens of reports every day, I mean, I hear from one or two people every day myself, just me. We're talking about a lot of spaceships cruising the skies. Uh, That would be, I would think, a hazard to commercial aviation, just avoiding these guys. And that sooner or later, we'd have a high-resolution photograph or even some solid piece of hardware, a landing gear or something on the ground that would constitute evidence. Well, you know, the contradiction in UFO research is that UFOs are apparently both everywhere and nowhere. There's tens of thousands of UFO photographs, uh, alleged UFO photographs, and more each week, <laughs> as you and I both know because people send them to us. And yet, and yet, where's the evidence? If there was actually hard evidence that aliens are visiting us, it should be crystal clear, even if you concede that maybe a few of them were scuttled away by you know, government agents or something. There's just too many sightings and reports, if these things are, are real, to credibly conclude that there would be no evidence for them whatsoever. Well, what sort of evidence would convince you? I mean, you're obviously considered a skeptic, as am I. And, uh, but, you know, people say, well, nothing would convince you. I, I don't think that's true, is it? 
No, it's not true at all. As a skeptic and as a researcher, I would love to see good evidence of aliens. So, you know, what would constitute good evidence? Well, one of them would be the proverbial landing on the White House lawn, for example. But of course, there's many other types of evidence that might be considered, you know, really valid. So, for example, if there was a piece of a spacecraft, uh, alien bodies, if, if, there, if there was an entity that was clearly not human, unlike any mammal or other animal that we know, there you go. That's hard evidence. You know, I notice that this subject is very emotional. If I express an opinion that I'm a little doubtful that the evidence is any good for visitation, I'm immediately subject to ad hominem attack. It's not a discussion. It's an argument. What what's the psychology of that? What's going on here? It's interesting that that's exactly right, because what happens is that there's this binary polarized idea in UFO research particularly, and it applies to other areas of the paranormal as well, but certainly UFOs, there's this notion that if you're a skeptic, if you're a scientist, or astronomer, and you disagree with the idea that aliens are visiting us and have crashed and all this sort of thing, that you are either one of two things. You're either what's called a sheeple or too stupid to really know what's going on and you're just buying into the story by big government, or you're part of the conspiracy. And that's a very damaging mindset. And in that context, it's not surprising that discussions about UFOs are not productive. You know, this idea of conspiracy theories, uh, on the one hand, you could say it seems illogical, but obviously it's not illogical because uh, conspiracy theories are very popular, they're very widespread, and they're very durable. What's going on? They are very widespread. Uh, And in fact, uh, there's been really interesting research coming out over the past decade or so about the psychology of the conspiracy theorist. And what you find is that conspiracy theories really cross all boundaries, you know, socioeconomic, gender, uh, liberals, Democrats, Republicans, they all have their own versions of it. <laughs> and so it's, it's easy to sort of cast aspersions and say, well, well, they think that crazy thing, but we have the truth. Like, no, 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 no. We all have our, our pet conspiracies uh, that we, we subscribe to to some degree or another. There's a couple reasons for that. One of them is that conspiracy theories serve as, as a group identity. You can tell a lot by a person by looking at what exactly they they believe. And oftentimes people will endorse conspiracies, not because they necessarily completely agree with the literal truth of it, but because it it promotes a worldview that they subscribe to. You know, in psychology, it's called confirmation bias, right? So we see we see a, a particular data set of information, and we pick and choose what parts we pay attention to. And oftentimes, it, it's unconscious. We don't we're not even aware of it. And, and similarly, we will tend to dismiss or ignore or not even pay attention to evidence and facts that don't support what we believe. Ben, you know, the people who advocate the, the idea of UFOs sailing the skies have been saying for years that there is secret information stacked up by the government somewhere that would prove that, uh, you know, this is actually happening. Is this ever going to go away, or are the conspiracy theorists going to be saying forever that, you know, there's hidden information? I mean, when does this end? It's never going to end because inherent in conspiracy belief, and particularly regarding UFOs and aliens, there's always more information they believe they're not getting. The nature of conspiracy belief is that there's always more out there that is inaccessible. And no matter how much information, no matter how many facts, no no matter what's out there, they're not going to accept it. They will always be convinced that whatever is out there is only the tip of the iceberg or part of a disinformation campaign, and they're going to keep believing. Ben Radford, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thanks for having me on, Seth. Always great to talk to you. Benjamin Radford is a research fellow with the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. Well, what can we conclude about this new evidence for UFOs? Yeah, well, of course, this is something that has been wished for by the UFO community for a very long time, disclosure. Plenty of people have been arguing we just got to get to those secret government files, and at least in some sense, I guess we did. The trouble is that they've been a little bit like, I don't know, Al Capone's secret safe. Not terribly interesting when you opened up the files, at least not so far. And in this case, you want to look closely at why this project was started, the UFO office at the Pentagon, who started it, where the money went, what it accomplished, and what the possible motivations were in bringing the story to light. 
Right. And obviously, if there's more evidence that comes out and it's better than what they've offered so far, of course, that will be extraordinarily interesting. But I think they know that themselves. Well, thanks to the hardworking team whose contributions to this show have been identified, Senior Producer Gary Niederhoff, Operations Manager Barbara Vance, and Intern Katrina Hunter. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David, and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life, including the rings of Saturn. And a big thanks also to our listeners. And to reach us directly with your comments, throw in some faint praise, and then email it all to bigpicturescience at SETI.org. Skeptic Check is brought to you thanks to a generous grant from the Trimberger Family Foundation. At the Trimberger Family Foundation, we hold that skepticism is a lamp that lights the way to truth. Trimberger.org.